And then finally, we had uh, a second order system that generically we wrote like that. <coughs> Or K is the steady state gain times how is the time constant squiggly is the damping coefficient. We just finished talking about how this system responds to a step change given different values of squiggly. Okay. And we learned that if it was between, for example, 0 and 1, the system could oscillate. So now what we're trying to do is to develop some more general tools that we can apply to system of any complexity. So that we can avoid doing first order, second order, third order, fourth order, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is, this is meant to generalize what we've learned so far. So um, we can write transfer functions. Hmm. I got a new battery, supposedly. Yeah. Um, so generically, we'll write transfer functions in this form. This is uh, the most general form we'll be interested in. So we have a numerator polynomial in S. Okay. And the order of that polynomial is M. For all the problems we've considered so far, this is just a constant. But in general, it could be some power of S here. We have a denominator polynomial, that's power um, n. And you can see that, that corresponds to the order of the system. So if it's first order, that thing is first order in S, if it's second order system, it's second order in S, and so on and so forth. The coefficients a is and b's there are known in the context of any particular problem they're constants. And then we might have additionally a time delay, which I'll come back to in a minute. So I started talking about this last time. Um, so if we look at the roots of this denominator, okay, so this denominator polynomial looks like this. We set that equal to zero and find the roots. The roots are going to be denoted p1, p2, all the way up to pn. So it's the nth order polynomial. You're going to have n roots, obviously. And these roots are called the poles of the system. As we'll learn pretty soon, these are exactly the same thing as the eigenvalues. Right? So when you take a linear system and you find a transfer function, you can compute these poles. If you were just to find the eigenvalues of the linear system without even doing a Laplace transfer function, you'd find the same things. We'll, I'll show you that later. Okay. All right, so not surprisingly, if these correspond to the eigenvalues, you might imagine that the response of the system has, you know, we've learned that um, the eigenvalues have a lot to do with the response. So last time I did this on the board, I don't have time to do it again, but I tried to convince you that without doing partial fraction expansion, right? So we want to <coughs> try to find out what is the qualitative behavior of the system without doing partial fraction expansion, because that's really the bottleneck in doing the inverse Laplace transform. Right, if it's in the table, it's easy. If it's not in the table, you've got to break it up into pieces. that are in the table using uh, partial fractions. That's not so fun. So last time I made this argument, if you have poles that look like this, and you went through the process of writing, so if, you know, if these are the poles, then that meant you factored this denominator, and then you could write the partial fraction for each of those factors, like we did before. And then you find the solution looks like this. It has term, an exponential term involving each of these poles, plus some other terms that involve the input, whatever the input might be. So don't worry about that right now. Okay. So in other words, these poles that you find at the roots of this denominator directly appear in the exponential terms of the solution. Okay. Now, I don't know what the alphas are, because to find the alphas, you have to actually do the partial fraction expansion and evaluate it, which I don't want to do. So I'm interested in the qualitative response. So let's say, for a given pole P here, we would just say P is one of these, P is up here, that it's, a, it's negative and it's real. Okay? So that means this term will decay to zero, right? Because if this is minus 2P, for example, as time goes, as time increases, that term will go to zero. If, on the other hand, it's real but it's positive, then this term is going to blow up, right? So just like, well, I'll come back to this. All right. So let's say instead of it being um, a, a real number, it's a complex number. Okay. And hopefully you remember this from 361, if not earlier. So that means we can write the whole in this form. So alpha and beta are not the same as the alpha. Oh, those are A's and B's, good. Um, so that's the real part of the root. And that's the imaginary part, and j is the imaginary number. Okay. We learned last time that you can rewrite it something that looks like this in terms of an exponential involving the real part and a sine function involving the imaginary part. So that means terms that look like this are going to exhibit oscillatory behavior, like this on the <coughs> second order underdamp system. And if this, if the real part is less than zero, then this exponential will decay, right? And this term will be going to zero. On the other hand, if, the, if that thing is greater than zero, the real part, then um, this term will blow up. 
and then um, the oscillations will grow. Okay. So if somebody asked you, um, is a system capable of exhibiting oscillations? The answer is only if it has poles that have that are complex. Okay. If all the poles are real, they can't oscillate. Okay. If someone asks you, is the system stable? In other words, is the output bounded? If I put in a bounded input. You can just look at the real part. If all the real parts are, are negative, it's stable. If even one of the poles has a positive real part, it's not stable. It's just like what we learned for eigenvalues, right? Same thing. So the point is you can learn this information about whether it can oscillate, whether it can um, whether it's stable or not. You can learn this just from factoring this, this denominator. You don't have to do any of that. You don't actually ever find the response. You know conceptually it looks like this, but you don't have to do the whole, whole spiel. Okay. So then the problem is kind of reduced just to finding the roots of this thing. And for problems that you do in class and on tests, it would be easy to find the roots of this thing. Um, if this were a more complex problem, you could just go to MATLAB and find the roots without any problem. Okay. So that explains why this polynomial is important. It generates the poles, and the poles affect the response like this. Now I'll talk about what's the numerator. Okay. So you take the numerator polynomial. Set that equal to zero, you find its roots, those are called the zeros. Okay. If this is an mth order polynomial, there'll be m of them. Okay. And just to give you some idea of what this can do, let's say you had a system that looks like this. So it looks like what you've seen before. It has its second order system, it's over damped, right? Because we we can factor the denominator in two real roots and they're distinct. That makes it over damped. And then now the new thing is it has this in the numerator. Instead of just being 1, it's now a plus 1. Okay. So what did I do here? Well, I wanted to compute what is the response of this system for a step change. That's what I usually, if I want to know what the input is, it's a step change. So I multiply <coughs> this thing by m over s. And then I found the inverse Laplace transform. The good thing is that thing is in the table. Okay. So if you put an s here, you don't have this, that entry is in the table. And the, the answer is this, this thing right here. Okay. And then you subsequently multiply that times km, like usual. Okay. All right, so why is that interesting? Well, the solution is still down there if you're writing. It's the same thing. OK, so this is a plot <coughs> of this solution. Um, now, I guess for, I forget, there's, there's already been values chosen the output's scaled by cam, so it doesn't matter what the value of cam is. But there were values ch chosen for tau 1 and tau 2 to generate this plot, and I can't quite remember what they are. But the plot is uh, really meant to show you what is the effect of tau A. Okay? So you see if this tau A is positive, um, but less than, le or you know, between 0 and 4, you get something that looks pretty, you know, you should be used to this, right? Starts at 0 goes up kind of exponentially. So it looks a lot like a first order response or the second order response as we've talked about before. Um, if this thing, I think the way, I could be incorrect on this, but I don't think so. If this tau A is greater than the larger of tau 1 or tau 2, because again, I don't remember what the values of tau 1 and tau 2 are for this example, but if tau A is larger than the larger of those two, so in other words, this one's 2 and this one's 4, if tau A is greater than 4, then you see this behavior here. The output goes up above and then comes back to the, to the value. So this is what we call overshooting behavior. And the bigger the value of tau A is, the greater this overshoot is, right? So you see from one steady state to another, the output goes from 0 to 1. But during the transient, if tau A is 16, it goes all the way up to like 2.5. Okay. And this would obviously have implications if you were like operating a plant, right? If you're trying to take the reactor temperature from one temperature to another, and it went up 250% higher than you wanted it to, that would not be good. So you'd have to take that into account. But the thing I'm really focusing on is if it's negative, OK? So if, you see, if it's negative, you see this kind of strange behavior, which we saw a little bit in the example we did last um, Friday using simulate, is that it, it goes in the wrong direction. right? So if it's minus 1, tau A is minus 1, it just barely goes in the wrong direction. If it's minus 4, it goes in the wrong direction quite a bit. For minus 16, it really goes in the wrong direction. So that is what's called inverse response. Okay? And that happens if the tau A is negative for this particular example. And the reason this is so important is because 
number one. It's, you can imagine this would, if you were operating a plant, right, and you wanted to increase the temperature, and you changed some input and initially went back negative, you'd say, I changed the wrong direction, right? Then you change it the other direction because you think you actually did the wrong thing. So this kind of behavior is very confusing to an operator. It's also very confusing as we'll learn to a controller because the effect of the input in, at one point is negative, but ultimately is positive. So that raises lots of difficulties for control, as we'll see. Okay? So this is what's called inverse response. So um, hopefully we have a general spiel here. Guess not. Well, OK, so if someone asks you, can a system exhibit inverse response okay, from the kind I just showed you? The answer is, well, if one of the, if one of the zeros is negative, it can. So in other words, if you find these zeros and they're all positive, the system can't exhibit inverse response. If one of these zeros is negative, then it can. Okay. So in this case, if you were to find the zero of this thing, that denominator, for this example, n of s is equal to tau a s plus 1. And if you set that equal to 0, obviously get Right? This is the root of that polynomial. And so if tau a is a positive number, then this is going to be negative. And therefore, you can see this kind of inverse response behavior. And we'll come back to this a lot when we do control. Okay. So you see the idea now? Someone asks you, can the system oscillate? You check the poles, see if they're complex. If they are, yes. Is the system stable? Check the poles. Are all the positive real parts negative? Then yes. And the system exhibit an inverse response, check the zeros. If one of them is negative, it can't. You see, and you never found the you've never actually found the solution to do any of this. I did in this case, but you don't have to in general. Okay? Alright. So now on to time delay. So I'm just picking this equation apart. Right? I told you why this is important. The poles, this is important, those are the zeros. Now I'm coming to this time delay. Okay. Um, so the top, the, we've already talked about this, but there's a variety of reasons why you might have a time delay in your problem. You remember what a time delay is, right? Let's see if we have a picture. Here's a good picture. Okay. So a time delay means that, for example, um, let's say this is the signal you want to achieve called x, but the actual signal you get is y. So there's a delay between x and y. y between x and y, period, y, um, is because there might be transportation down the pipe. Okay. I showed you this example already. We have some reactor sitting here. You're metering in the ingredients here for this reaction. Uh, in the pro process design, which was you know, 50 years before you got to the plant, maybe, um, they decided you know, they're going to mix the ingredients up here because it's convenient to mix there because the pipes are close to each other. They don't have to run, you know, to feed, feed more pipe because that's how they think. I'll tell you who they are later. Okay. All you know is if I use the word they, we're afraid of them. So you mix it right here, and then it takes some amount of time to propagate down that pipe. Okay. So if you want to change the composition, you can change it immediately at this point, but you don't change it to the reactor until the amount of time it takes for the slug of material to get to the reactor. And that, that's the, this time delay theta. Obviously, it's going to have to do with the volumetric flow and the cross-sectional area of the pipe. And, okay, but conceptually, you can see what I'm saying. Um, another thing might be analysis. So let's say you get something coming out of this, right? And you want to measure the composition of this. So what do you do? You have a GC up here somewhere. It's usually it's separate from the plant because you can't have a GC sitting outside, so it's in a little building. And so you gotta, you know, you gotta take a sample and transport it to this GC, right? And so the amount of time it takes to get that sample from the reactor to the GC and do the analysis is, is a time delay as well. Okay. And the thing about time delays we'll learn is that the critical thing and one of the most critical things in process control is how big the time delay is compared to the dynamics of the process. So that's usually expressed, this is a sidebar of sorts, by this ratio. Okay. 
tau is the time constant, right? It determines how fast the um, output response and the input phase is this time delay. If this ratio is small, control is easy because time delay is really kind of small. Okay. So if someone said, oh, the time delay is one minute, and you want to know if that's good or bad, it, it only matters relative to the time constant. If the time constant is an hour, one minute is trivial. If the time constant is, is 30 seconds, one minute is huge. Okay, so we'll come back to this, and you'll see this come up over and over again. But, you know, one thing that makes process control unique, if you have any friends in the other disciplines of engineering, like mechanical or electrical, they'll take their own control classes, and they'll never worry about time delay, because time delay seems to be something that primarily occur in chemical systems, not, not in mechanical or, um, like a robot doesn't have a time delay, right? Because you, you don't send a signal down a, down a wire that takes a long time to get to the robot's arm or something like this. So, this is unique to chemical process, or not, should say chemical process, but process control problems, okay? So we worry a lot about time delays, that's, that's the preface here, okay? So it might be due to transportation flow, we call that an input delay, that's the first example I gave you. It might be due to, you have to do some analysis of a sample, that's what we call an output delay, okay? But in any, in, in any case, it doesn't matter, they're treated the same way, okay? So this is, this is a pure delay, it's called. So that means y is just a delayed version of x, whatever x is. And um, theta here is the time delay. So that's this picture right here. Right? Here's x, that's the input, and here's the delayed version of x, y. That's a pure time delay. We talked about this already, the Laplace transform of a pure time delay, which in this case, y is the output and x is the input, so the transfer function is just this. So if you see an exponential term like that, that means time delay. That's what you saw back here, too. I'm flipping around towards you. Okay, that's that right there. All right. Now, t very few systems of interest to us are pure time delays. They're usually time delays plus some dynamics. So this is the most simplest and most common thing. This is the first order plus time delay model, okay? So first of all, you have the first order. If you don't have, sorry, stand over here. If you don't have this, Right, just first order, like we've seen, and then you have the time delay. So the first order part would be the process itself, and then the time delay would be because you have a time delay in delivering ingredients or sampling or something like that. Okay. And again, the key thing here, when we start talking about control, is how big is that theta relative to that tau? Okay. This seems largely redundant. <laughs> Okay. I guess because I've already shown you the picture here. Okay, so that's that's what a that's just an example, so you can see what a time delay looks like. Okay, okay. So what do we not like about time delays? Well, one thing we don't like about them, um, just from a mathematical standpoint, is this is not a rational function. You know what a rational function is? It's the ratio of two polynomials. It's gonna be expressed as the ratio of two polynomials. And so we often like to use a rational approximation of this time delay because a lot of the methods that we deal with as we go through the course require that G is simply the ratio of two polynomials with no time delay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can approximate the time delay by rational functions so that the tools we develop later can be used with Okay. And so just to motivate this, you have this, everyone remembers what the uh, power series expansion of e to the x is. You remember this got to be first semester calculus. I'm sure you, you look back um, very happily at those days, right? e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial. I should ring a bell. It's the power series expansion of e to the x. Okay. So in this case, x is just minus theta s. And I, I wrote it out here. Okay. Now this is not very practical, right? because um, this is an infinite expansion. And I think I used this notation. It's not going to use a lot in this class, but do you, you know what this means? It means I've neglected all terms that are order s to the sixth and higher. <coughs> Just, okay? All right. So this is the actual expansion. We know that this would be a perfect representation if we chose to keep an infinite number of terms, but that's not particularly practical. Okay? So, there's actually three approximations that we use. The first one, which isn't explicitly stated here, but we do use it, is if, if we wanted to just keep the first two terms of this Taylor series expansion, okay? in other words, we throw all these other terms out, you could approximate e to the minus theta s is 1 minus theta s. 
That's as simple as it gets. Okay? It's the simplest, also the least accurate. So sometimes I'll use that, but I'll tell you I'm going to use that. The, the more sophisticated ones are called Pade approximations. So here's the first one. Okay. So we're going to approximate e to the minus theta s with this ratio here. And the reason I did the Taylor series expansion, not only to show you we might just use that, is to show you that this, this is a reasonable approximation. How do I show that? Well, you, I don't remember when you, you learned to do you know, long division of polynomials. Is that? I keep thinking elementary school. That's probably not quite right. OK. Um, so if you were to divide these two things, you could show that you get this here. And so if we look at this expression, if this was a perfect approximation, it would agree with the Taylor series expansion forever, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this approximation relative to this expansion and see how accurate it is, because the more terms I get right, the better. So 1, check. Minus theta, s, check. The s squared term, check. The f, s cubed term, not check, right? It, this s cubed term is not the same as that s cubed term. So... So we use this terminology, again, we don't use this a lot in the class, but we say the error is order s cubed, meaning this approximation agrees with the Taylor series expansion until the s cubed term. That's different. Okay? So the first thing I told you, which was just 1 minus theta s, is the error is order s squared, right? Because it doesn't even include this term. Now, the, this expansion agrees with this one, this one, this one, but not this one. Okay? And in principle, you could do this. We tend not to use this because, look, it's really complicated to work with, but this is a, sec a second order Pade approximation, and it's the ratio of these two polynomials. And if you were to play the same game of dividing these two, you would find this agrees all the way out to here. This doesn't agree with that one, but it agrees with that one and that one, so it's order S to the fifth. More accurate. Okay. All right, so in this class, I'm going to tend to either use the really simple one, just that, or I'll tell you to use this one. I don't think we'll ever actually use that one. It's just hard to work with because that gives you a higher order polynomials and it's kind of painful. Okay? All right. So this is kind of mathematics look reasonable, I think. Um, so as you'll learn in, in this class, we have a, sorry, I have to go back a second. We have, or will develop, um, an obsession with this type of model. Okay? We like this model a lot. And the reason for this is because this is the simplest type of model that can describe anything of practical interest to us. Okay? First of all, it has to have some inherent dynamics with a time constant, and then if there's a delay, you can have that. So it doesn't get any simpler than this. Okay? So we spend a lot of time learning ways to find models like this and use models like this. So what I'm doing in this last set of slides here <coughs> is I'm teaching you um, methods that we might use to derive a simple model from more complex models. So just to go to the bottom, let's say that you have this transfer function. Okay, Okay. well that's a little bit unwieldy, but the main thing is let's say that the methods that you want to apply to this transfer function only apply if it's that first order plus time delay thing. In other words, the method doesn't even apply to this. Okay? So what I want to do is approximate this thing by first order plus time delay model so that I can subsequently use the tools that are only applicable to first order plus time delay. Okay? So there's kind of two methods to do this. So this example, what it shows is this is the transfer function, these are the two answers. So how did I get the two answers? And I don't provide any justification for why these methods work other than I'll show you they work in it on the next slide. Okay. All right. So one of the most important things in control or dynamics in general is this so-called dominant time constant. So if you look at this example, there's three time constants, right? There's a thousand in the denominator. Five, three, and one half. The dominant time constant is the larger one the largest one, 5. Okay. The reason the uh, dominant time constant matters is because um, this will control, so things that have a small time constant, if you look at the solution, right, they all are e to the minus pt. Um, things that are small decay quickly. And so the thing that ultimately controls the response is the largest value of tau. That's the thing that will decay the slowest. So we call that the dominant time constant. 
So what the text is meant to do is to explain how I got from here to here with these two methods. The first method is called uh, the Taylor series method. It's got nothing to do with the Taylor series method, as far as I know, that I just showed you. I don't know. Maybe it does, but... All right. So first of all, so, we're, so I'm going to do this step by step here. So we aspire to find an approximation, we'll call it GTF for Taylor series of S, an approximation of this thing here. Okay. The first thing it says is retain the dominant time constant. That means that's supposed to be a five. Keep the term that involves the largest time constant. So you put that in there. That's five s plus one. Okay. Then it says approximate the other time constant as time delays. Okay. So then I'm going to have a term. So I'm going to keep the k there. That doesn't change. Okay, whatever k is doesn't make any difference. As you can see. And then now I want to get e to the minus theta s. Okay. And the question is, what is theta? How did I find theta here? Okay. Well, what I did, let me make sure that I get it right so that when I get to the answer, I get the right answer. Okay. So I added the two time constants in the denominator. Okay. Right? Those are the two remaining ones I didn't retain, three and four. And then I subtracted off this tau value in the numerator. Okay. So minus <coughs> minus 0 0.1 unless I can't and is 3.6. Okay. And you see a minus 3.6 there. Okay. Alright, so that's how you find that one. Okay. So the second one now, Taylor is a famous mathematician. The Skogestad is a nice guy in Norway. I know him. Good guy. Um, he came up with his own method because he thought this method was inadequate. Okay? And so it's a little bit different. So let's see how, what we do here. Okay. So first of all, you have to find the tau. Okay, it's, it's again going to look like this. Tau s plus 1 a e to the minus theta s. And he has a different way of finding tau. He doesn't just retain the largest time constant. He, well, he does keep that. But then he adds 1 half the next largest one. The next largest one is 3. So he, get, he gets the tau to be 6.5, right? Okay. And then, to find the theta... He takes um, the remaining half of this, I believe. I'll see if I'm right in a second. He adds on the one that he hasn't used that, and then he again subtracts off the one from the numerator. And unless I'm mistaken, that's 2.1. Okay, no explanation as to why these are reasonable approaches. Just gotta trust me on this. Okay, and I'll show you in a minute what they were. Alright, so so the motivation here again is that we don't want to use something like this because the, we're gonna develop a lot of methods and only apply to models that look like this. We want to have a method to take any model of arbitrary complexity and simplify it to be this. Something like this, okay? All right, so here's a plot from the book, and I'm going to actually regenerate this thing using Simulink just to show you. And so what is being compared here is what is the response of this thing to a step input, this thing to a step input, and this thing to a step input. Because if, it's, if they're exactly the same, they'll, the plots will be on top of each other, right? So this is a plot of what we call the normalized output. Okay, It just means the output divided by km as usual, versus time. So how do you do this? I'll show you in a minute, but you, you could take this into simulate, simulate how this responds to a step change, and then you get the solid line here called actual. Okay, And then you do the same thing for these two approximations, which I'll show you in a moment how to do that. Okay? And then you get the two plots shown called Skogestad and Taylor series. So what you see is they're a little bit different down here. Um, but they're, you know, if you're in a plant, 
you'd call these things essentially identical. Okay. Because in a real plant, hopefully, I haven't really focused on this, but if this were, if this were um, you know, let's say you were trying to match a model to data, this would be considered really quite good. Because okay? the real world is a lot diff more difficult to be perfect than you learn in academia. So either one of these is fine. If I had to pick which one I'd prefer, I'd probably pick this one because, see, it agrees a little bit better down here than the, than the Taylor series one. But they're not a lot different. Okay. So, the, so when you guys, I know that you're doing lab and I've talked to a group or two where there's some modeling involved. Um, this, is the, this is a sidebar, but this is the kind of thing you would want to do if you do modeling in the laboratory. Actual would mean your plant data, you know, data from your process. And then this would be a prediction from your model, like plot them and see if they look close to each other. Okay, anyway, sidebar there. All right, so you can do this thing in Simulink. Let me um, attempt to open up Simulink, you know how that can go. Yeah, often not so smooth, but let's give it a shot. Now, um, if you guys have been looking at the website, you see that we're in control and like there's a lot of stuff up there now. In fact, um, I think the MATLAB homework, I know, Friday, that you're, that you're, you're assigned Fridays to a week from Friday is up there, and the homework after that is also up there. I mean, depending on how far you want to work ahead, yeah. Homework one and two solutions. Yeah, open the, the TAs are having trouble finding the solution, so I'm going to work with them today at noon. I, I have the solution. They don't seem to have the solution. That's okay. It. Okay. So we should have it up there later today. Uh, two, we're not going to we're not we're going to try not to post the solutions for homeworks while you're supposed to be doing them. Right. So if I give it to you I'll, a week later, we'll post the solution. Hopefully during that week period, you'll try to do it yourself. Okay. If not, you can look at the solution, but it won't help much of the test is what I fear. Um, so where was I headed with this? Oh, where I was headed with this is that. Um, I don't think we posted these MATLAB. If someone sends me an email, we can post all these MATLAB examples if you want them. Yeah. And then you can simply download them yourself and run them, and that might help you learn, especially when you have a MATLAB homework. Someone's going to have to, to, to tell me, because I can't remember, obviously. We've established that. All right. So we open up Simulink here and uh, go to the right directory and find the right example. Is it this thing? Looks good. Okay. So I built this. Okay. All the, all the examples in the class I built, and be, well, I use MATLAB. But something like this might take like 10 minutes to build or something like that, or less. Okay. So what am I doing here conceptually? I'm putting a step change through the original transfer function the transfer function they got from that Taylor series, and then this Skogasad approximation. Okay, so I'm putting that input through each of these, and then I'm storing each of the outputs in a different vector called y1, y2, and y3. And then subsequently, I will plot y1, y2, and y3 versus time and see if they lay on top of each other. Okay, so most of this stuff you've seen, like you know how to put a step, you've done this. That's nothing new. Okay, you know how to do this, but. Um, if you didn't, this is